Battle for Azeroth is considered to be largely a very dark period of time in World of Warcraft. Coming off the back of Legion, which was very well received, Blizzard decided to double down on the systems and chores from Legion, such as Borrowed Power and World Quest. Today I'm asking the question, was Battle for Azeroth as bad as I remember? Let's do this. Similarly to my Legion video, which you can watch here by the way, this video will be broken up into segments which I will chapter and timestamp in the description, if there are sections you would prefer to jump to. The first segment of this video will be a story recap, which will be the longest segment by far, so feel free to skip over that if you have no interest in it. I'll also be skipping PvP, as I wouldn't be able to give a clear evaluation on it. I hope you will enjoy. Some backstory before we begin. After the Third War, but before World of Warcraft takes place, Jaina Proudmoore establishes Theramore, a faction neutral settlement on the shores of Dustwallen Marsh. The Third War taught Jaina a valuable lesson in unity. Horde and Alliance should not be divided, especially when there are greater dangers for both factions, such as the Scourge or the Burning Legion. She maintained good relations with the recent founder of Ogrima and the Horde leader at the time, Thrall who she had already gotten close with during the peak of the Third War while defending Hyjal against Archimonde and the Burning Legion in Warcraft 3. There was an issue here though, as her father, Admiral Dalin Proudmoore, the leader of Kul Tiras and Jaina's father, decided that it was a good time to cut down the Horde before they gained a meaningful foothold in Kalimdor. During the Second War, Dalin lost his son Derek Proudmoore, Jaina's brother, to the Horde. In his eyes, it was time for revenge. Jaina made a decision to side with the Horde as she was dedicated to keeping the peace. Her father didn't see it that way, attacked and was killed. The Kingdom of Kul Tiras blamed Jaina for this. The rest of the Alliance were too busy dealing with the aftermath of the Third War, and the Kul Tirans promptly left the Alliance and kept themselves isolated. It's important to note Sylvanas' deal with the Jailer too. Around the time of Cataclysm, Sylvanas jumped off Icecrown Citadel to her death, feeling she had no reason to go on now her greatest enemy Arthas was gone. She was promptly sent to the moor by the Arbiter. Here, nine more sworn Valkyr found her, and brought her to the Jailer, who promised her that they can break the cycle of life and death together. They both see it as unfair. He was the first Arbiter and saw countless lives and how they're supposed to be judged based on the will of the first ones, getting separated from families and judged out of context, which made him kind of mad. Which is why after locking him up, the Pantheon of Death put a mechanical Arbiter in his place. She's also angered that the Arbiter sent her to the Moor, the realm where the most unforgivable souls go, for committing atrocities she was forced to by Arthas, while sending people like Zol'jin, who is responsible for the deaths of her family members and many more, by his own volition no less, to Revendreth, a plain in the Shadowlands where souls get penance for their wrongdoings. She decided to side with Zoval after deliberating it for many years, around the time of Legion where she is made Warchief. At the end of Legion we kill Argus. Argus was filled with death magic by the Dreadlords, who are all loyal to Sire Denathrius, their creator and father essentially. Denathrius works for the Jailer, causing Argus to become a creature of death, meaning when he dies, he'd be sent to the Shadowlands instead of the Realm of Order, where Titans normally go. That's why when we kill Argus, we actually break the Arbiter, sending all souls that die into the Moor, giving more power to the Jailer. Now that the Arbiter is broken, it's feeding time for the Jailer. Sylvanas' task was to cause maximum death to empower the Jailer, before she would make a break for it to the Shadowlands, where the final part of his plan was supposed to take place. Another important thing before the story of BFA takes place is the Gathering, an event taking place after Legion but before BFA, where the living relatives from Stormwind were supposed to meet their undead relatives from Undercity. The meeting would take place in Arathi Highlands with both Sylvanas and Anduin attending. The meeting went well until a certain point. With Anduin also came Kalia Menethil, the only living heir to Lordaeron and sister of Arthas. Some of the Forsaken relatives started defecting, going over to the Alliance side. It didn't help that Kalia influenced them. Some of the Forsaken saw this and to show their loyalty started running away from the meeting. Sylvanas got mad and then killed all the defectors, including Kalia, who was later resurrected into a strange state of light-infused undeath by Anaru. Sylvanas also killed the Forsaken who were heading back to her, Later on in Undercity, she twisted this into propaganda and the Forsaken populace bought into it. As a consequence of this, tensions between the Horde and the Alliance would start to grow and Anduin would send many SI7 spies into Ogrima. At the end of Legion, Sargeras stabbed the world with his sword Gorobol. 
This caused the world soul of Azeroth to bleed what is known as Azerite, one of the most powerful substances known in Warcraft. Both factions didn't want the other one to get it, causing tension between the two. The SI7 spies in Ogrima are important because Sylvanas was aware of these spies. When they were among her ranks, she would pretend that the Horde was planning on taking over Silithus, causing a stronger presence of Alliance, specifically Night Elves. Sylvanas was playing the long game, and she really wanted to break the Alliance with a much more menacing plan. The deal between the Jailer and Sylvanas was to cause as much death as possible to feed the Jailer, which would in turn power up Sylvanas as well. So her plan was to take over Darkshore and Teldrassil, slaying Night Elves and their leader, Malfurion Stormrage. Together with Varrock Sourfang, Sylvanas and Nathanos would lead the charge. They tore through Darkshore and Sourfang even managed to capture Malfurion, but he let him go. Sylvanas, in her rage over this, came up with an even more deadly plan, to burn down Teldrassil, and that's exactly what she did, causing mass death and sending a lot of souls into the moor. The Night Elves questioned why Alun didn't help them, and saw this as a sign that their goddess had abandoned them. In truth, Alun sensed the anima drought in Ardenweald, the Shadowlands realm of her sister, the Winter Queen, and thought that the souls of the Kaldori from Teldrassil would help the drought. What Alun did not know was that all of those souls were rerouted to the moor. Tyrande, in her rage, takes part in a really dangerous ritual to become the Night Warrior, which is basically the darkest aspect of Alun's power that is known to usually kill the user. With this power, the Horde successfully rocked back, but not without a lot of Night Elf death and destruction. If you needed a declaration of war, I'd say this is as good as any. The Fourth War begins. The Alliance in return would attack Lordaeron. Oh, and Jaina's back now, being much more chill than we saw her in Mists of Pandaria and Legion. And she also has a huge magic ship. This really annoyed me personally, as she had shown huge instability in the past, and it felt as if she'd just come back with a clean slate. I often wonder if the Dreadlord theory that players cooked up had anything to do with this. Anyway, the Alliance managed to fight their way into Lordaeron. Before entering the keep, Sourfang, disillusioned with the Horde, decides to surrender to the Alliance. Sourfang is an old orc, something that is very rare in Warcraft, and he just wants a warrior's death. He wants to join his son who died during Wrath of the Lich King after being raised by Arthas. But seeing no honour in this war, he willingly gives himself up to the Alliance. The Alliance break into the throne room, giving us some nice cinematic parallels with Arthas returning home in Warcraft 3. Sylvanas runs away and blights the whole city leaving it uninhabitable for both the living and the dead. Both sides leave the battlefield, having been sent into a war that neither side is really prepared for. The recent Legion invasion had really taken its toll, and both sides were in need of allies. To this end, they recruit a couple of friends on the side. The Nightborn and High Mountain Tauren join the Horde, while the Void Elves and the Lightforged Drenai join the Alliance. A couple more races would join the Fold later throughout the Fourth War, but this was still not enough and both sides were in need of a proper fleet. Luckily for Sylvanas, the Stormwind Stockades held Princess Talanji and Prophet Zol of the Zandalari Empire as prisoners. The Zandalari Empire had one of the greatest fleets in the world, so it was her reasoning that by freeing them, the Horde could get the Zandalari Trolls as allies. Nathanos leads an operation into the heart of Stormwind, and the two prisoners are liberated. Along the way, they also come across Sourfang, who refuses to leave the prison. The Alliance go in hot pursuit, but Princess Talanji summons Razan, the Lower of Kings, and he gives their ship a nitro boost and they make quick way towards Zandalar. Having learned that the Horde now has a powerful fleet, Jaina promises to go back to Kul Tiras and try to bring them into the fold once again. The Horde champions were let into Dazara Law, the capital of Zandalar, with mostly open arms. The Alliance champions and Jaina would get arrested on sight by the Order of Catherine Proudmoore, Jaina's mother, and Dalin's widow. With her is also Priscilla Ashvane, who holds huge influence over the affairs of Kul Tiras with her Ashvane Trading Company. Whilst the Alliance champions are arrested, an old knight by the name of Cyrus Crestfall sends Flynn Fairwind, a spy, to set us free from Toldador, an island prison off the coast of Kul Tiras. Cyrus allows Alliance ships in the port of Boralus, and the Alliance champions then start trying to earn trust of Catherine Proudmoore, with the help of Cyrus, Flynn, and a girl named Talia who was orphaned during the Third War in Lordaeron, never knowing her family. She later turns out to be the daughter of Bolvar Fordragon. Along the way, it is discovered that Priscilla Ashvane has discovered Azerite, has been wanting to use it to overthrow Catherine Proudmoore. We reveal this plot to Catherine, Priscilla tries to take over but fails, and is promptly arrested and sent into Toldegore, while Jaina is freed from the same prison. Whilst proving our worth to House Proudmoore, we also discover that something bad is happening in the depths of the oceans, 
as many Tide Sages, who are basically sea priests in Kul Tiras, are falling to void corruption. There are many hints that Nazoth is up to something, but we don't know when and we don't know how. On the Horde side, the champions are slowly starting to earn the trust of the Zandalari people and King Rastakhan. The Zandalari, as many other trolls, worship the Lower. There are many important Lower, but the main one we'll be focusing on is the Lower of Kings, Razan. Throughout our adventures in Zandalar, we find out that the Prophet Zol is not as good of a guy as we may think he is, and he actually is allied with the Blood Trolls who worship Gahoon, which is an old god created by the Titans while they experimented in a facility known as Aldir, located in Nazmir. We chase after Zol to Atoll Dazar, which is a resting place for many Zandalari kings. Not too long after, Zol attacks Dazar alone. King Rastakhan chooses Bonsamdi as his next lower, tying his family with the powers of death. This proved to be worth it, as Zol was successfully fought back and even killed. The victory was won for the day. Throughout Horde adventures on Zandalar, we would occasionally get accompanied by the spirit of Vol Jin, who was trying to find out who actually told him to pick Sylvanas as the next warchief back in Legion. However, he wasn't able to find the answer. The truth was that it was Muzala who whispered it to him from the Shadowlands by the Order of the Jailer. During this time, our player character would slowly heal the wound left in Silithus from Sargeras' sword with the help of Magni Bronzebeard. He would gift us with a powerful necklace called the Heart of Azeroth that would grow in power as we healed Azeroth further. Of course, the rest of the world wasn't feeling as peaceful, and so began the next major battle in the Fourth War, the Battle for Stromgard, which was a battle that was ongoing for most of the Fourth War. Back on Zandalar and Kul Tiras, the Horde and the Alliance would be involved in an occasional skirmish, and there would be more fighting at sea while exploring islands that had large amounts of Azerite. Both factions would be involved in attacking Aldir and dealing with the artificial old god Gahoon. While these skirmishes were taking place, the Horde would accidentally discover the body of Derek Proudmoore, Jaina's brother that was mentioned earlier. Sylvanas would use his body in the most cruel of ways, hanging him up near Boralus, the capital of Kul Tiras, as bait during a heist, but she had even more sinister plans for him later. The Horde would also free Lady Ashvane from Toldagor, while Jaina would be given the title of Lord Admiral, having proven herself worthy to the throne. With the threat of Gahoon gone, it's time for the next major but short faction battle, the Battle of Dazara Law. This was a strike by the Alliance at the very heart of the Zandalari Empire, which has proven to be successful, as King Rastakhan, the leader of the Zandalari, was killed in the assault. The Alliance managed to flee the attack with the help of Jaina, and Princess Talanji would become Queen Talanji. This was a huge blow to the Horde, causing their fleet huge damage, and giving the Alliance an upper hand so far. In response to this, Sylvanas started working on the little twisted project to torture the very leadership of Kul Tiras, raising Derek Proudmoore as a Forsaken, and using him as a cruel weapon against the Alliance. Bane could not stand by this, and with a little bit of help, he freed Derek and brought him to the ruins of Theramore, where he asked to meet Jaina. Jaina was hesitant at meeting her brother as a Forsaken, but when she realised he was still of his own mind and volition, she accepted it. But knowing that Kul Tiras would never accept him like this, Jaina introduces Derek to Kalia Menethil, one of the rare people who could understand what he was going through. Back on the mainland in Kalimdor, a new battle would break out, the Battle for Darkshore, that would, like the Battle for Stromgard, last the majority of the Fourth War. At this time, Naga would suddenly start to appear on the shores of Zandalar and Kul Tiras. A Tortolan named Collector Kojo would be walking along the shores of Stormsong Valley, where he would come across a dagger near a makeshift altar. He would give this dagger to a Horde champion, this dagger was none other than Zalatath, the Shadow Priest artifact weapon from Legion. The thing with Zalatath is that no one is exactly sure what it is. Some say it's a forgotten old god, some say it's a part of Yoshiraj, but no one knows for sure. When we come across Zalatath in BFA, it tells us that the Naga are searching for three artifacts so that they could summon a huge storm and take over Azeroth. We go in search of these three artifacts and come across a High Elf trying to take one. The High Elf meets a bitter end, and Zalatav takes over her body. We find the other two artifacts, and Zalatav takes us to a place called the Crucible of Storms, where it is revealed that Zalatav's true master is Nazoth, and we finally get our first proper look in-game of the Old God. Zalatav offers the three artifacts in exchange for freedom, which Nazoth accepts. Zalatav departs, and Nazoth then lets the champion go as well, but not before giving them a gift which is pretty much a little eye on your forehead that will be there until you decide to remove it. A Horde Champion then gives this Dark Blade to Sylvanas Windrunner, who has a special plan for it later down the line. Back in Stormwind, Anduin was slowly building up trust with Varric Sourfang. 
Seeing as neither of them really believed in the war that they were caught up in, Anduin's thoughts were that the two of them could end the war by uniting the Alliance and the Horde against Sylvanas and her followers, so Anduin let Saurfan go. Sylvanas would send assassins after him, but they were successfully fought off. Zakan, the beloved troll known as Zappy Boy, would find Saurfang, who instructed Zakan to look for people among the Horde who would join the cause. Saurfang would then go to Nagran to get Thrall back in the game. With Nathanos Blightcaller at the helm, unbeknownst to the Alliance, Nathanos is carrying the vacant blade of Zalatath and is using it as a compass of sorts. He has it because Sylvanas has made a deal with none other than Queen Azara, the plan being that Azara would take care of the pesky Alliance while Sylvanas would give her Zalatath's blade. For those that don't know, Nazoth created the Naga after Azara accepted a deal at the end of the War of the Ancients that would save the Night Elves, who would have died during the Sundering and corrupted them into the Naga we know and love today. That being said, she wasn't too happy with Nazoth. Nazoth was kept in a Titan prison underneath the seas. Her plan was to open this prison and then kill Nazoth with Zalatath. The Alliance follows the Horde fleet, and the seas open up to Najatar with the powers of the Tidestone, one of the pillars of creation, a powerful artifact that we used to defeat the Legion but carelessly left at the tomb of Sargeras, which the Naga stole. We proceed to fall down into Najatar. Nathanos says he has to go somewhere secret, meaning he's going to give the blade to Ajara. Going back to when Bane freed Derek, well that came back to bite him, and he was arrested for treason and kept under Ogrimo awaiting execution. A Tauren Spiritwalker saw this in a vision who informed Lothamar, who then sent a Horde champion to meet with Thrall and Saurfang. Alliance spies figured this out as well, and sent an Alliance champion together with Jaina and Matthias Shaw, the leader of SI7. The two groups would meet under Ogrimo by accident, but decided to work together to free Bane. They face some trouble, but are ultimately successful. We would also pay a visit to the newly discovered Mechagon Isle, where with the united powers of gnomes and goblins, we would help overthrow King Mechagon, who wanted to turn all fleshy life mechanical. We storm the Eternal Palace and face Queen Ajara's minions, including the horribly mutated Priscilla Ashvane. We make our way to Queen Ajara and manage to defeat her while she was opening Nazoth's prison, with the intent on killing him. However, as we didn't know that she was going to murder him, all we managed to do is free Nazoth, who captures Queen Ajara. The true threat to Azeroth was now apparent, it was Nazoth. Lothamar and Jaina pretty much decide that the whole war is indeed pointless, so Lothamar is going to help Thrall and Saurfang with the revolution. Some time passes, with more and more Horde joining the cause, and the united forces of the Alliance and the Horde decide it's time to strike at Ogrima and finish this once and for all. They make their way through Duratar and reach the gates of Ogrima. Saurfang, realising how bloody this battle will be and how many lives will be lost, decides to challenge Sylvanas to a map Gara, a duel to the death, where no magic is allowed, only physical strength. Sylvanas accepts this duel. Saurfang is given Thrall's axe and the Rin Sword Shalomane. They fight, and Saurfang does seem to be getting an upper hand, but then Sylvanas uses her newfound powers and kills him, but not before telling everyone how the Horde is nothing, and how she sees them as toy soldiers in tin plate basically telling them that what they're doing does not matter, and that does make sense, considering she went to the Shadowlands. While Sylvanas did a lot of horrific things during BFA, it all had a purpose. She allied herself with the Jailer and believes that what she's doing is for the greater good. In her eyes, the end justifies the means, that being destroying the flawed cycle the First Ones have created in the Shadowlands. After killing Saurfang, she does her typical Banshee flying thing and escapes once more. While the gates of Ogrima are opened and a funeral ceremony is held for Saurfang, marking the end of the Fourth War. Sylvanas' job in BFA was done. She caused as much death as possible and soon it will be time to head into the Shadowlands herself and go into the final phase of the Jailer's plan. There is a big looming threat on the horizon for the now united forces of the Alliance and Horde, and that is Nazoth. During the Fourth War, Magni managed to gather quite a crowd at the Chamber of the Hearth, from where he was healing the world soul of Azeroth. Among the gathered was Ebonhorn, also known as Abyssian, one of the last uncorrupted black dragons, besides Rathian. Ebonhorn started to hear the whispers of Nazoth, slowly falling into corruption. Caligos then sends us to find a cure for him. He thought that Rathian may have something like that. While we seek for Rathian, we discover that he's actually in the Dragon Isles. We proceed to find a potion that cures Ebonhorn. This is the first hint of a big character that's about to come back, Rathian. Rathian reaches out to Magni, and together they make their way to Stormwind Keep to meet with Anduin, who has no idea that Rathian is coming back, 
after pretty much causing a couple of insanely huge wars and being the cause for the Legion's return. Anduin isn't thrilled about this, but there's no one else who understands the Old Gods better. Rathian explains that Nazoth doesn't attack as you'd expect. It's important to remember that Nazoth is the weakest Old God, thus his attacks are more psychological and maddening. He attacks the mind. Nazoth's plan was to bring about Nihilotha, a vision of Azeroth taken back by the Black Empire into reality. Nazoth would then invade, attacking Oldham to take over the Forge of Origination and attacking Vale of Eternal Blossoms to take over the engine of Nalak Shah, two powerful pieces of Titan machinery. The Forge of Origination is supposed to be used if Azeroth becomes overwhelmed with corruption. It's basically a big reset button for all life. A taste of such power can be seen in Oldham, which was originally a jungle, but is now a desert because the Forge was once used to defeat Lei Shen. The engine of Nalak Shah is a Titan device that can be used for flesh crafting. Seeing as the Void is all about fleshy creatures, who knows what Nazoth wanted to do with the engine. The Titan Keeper Ra Den was now residing in the Vale of Eternal Blossoms after being defeated in Mr. Pandaria. He travels to the Chamber of Heart in order to help restore the Forge of Origination. Nazoth would attack the chamber, opening a portal to Nihilotha and releasing its forces into the facility. Ra Den would fight with the other defenders, but once it became clear Nazoth was about to overtake the facility, Ra Den would tell Azeroth's champion to save Azeroth before charging at the portal to Nihilotha and using a lightning attack to destroy it. However, in the process he was pulled into the realm, becoming completely corrupted and now a servant of Nazoth. The champions of Azeroth attack Nihilotha. Here we fight against what seems to be a corrupted Rathian. We defeat him and it turns out that it was a faceless one, showing us a vision of what will be and what was, according to Nazoth. We also fight Ra Den, but sadly he was too far gone and had to be killed in battle. Along the way, the champions of Azeroth would come across Queen Ajara, getting interrogated by Dark Inquisitor Zanesh. We free her and she gives us Zalathath's blade and then decides to go looking for what she calls the True Throne. Rathian leads the way further into Nihilotha by breaking the carapace of Nazoth with the Dark Blade of Zalatath, seemingly destroying the blade in the process. We find Nazoth himself at the heart of it all. With the energies of the Heart of Azeroth and the engine of Nalak Shah, the Forge of Origination is empowered and rerouted to strike at the very heart of Nihilotha, Nazoth himself, which finally seemingly destroys the Old God and destroying any possibility of Nihilotha coming to pass. With this event, the true battle for Azeroth has come to an end, the forces of Azeroth claiming victory. However, the damage of the Fourth War was immense and Sylvanas was ready to enact the next part of the Jailer's plan, releasing him from his chains, which would allow him to consume the world soul of Azeroth. However, as at this moment, no one really knows what she wants to do, so there's a worldwide manhunt for Sylvanas and Nathanos. Nathanos would hide in his family home in the Eastern Plaguelands until we put an end to him. Here, Nathanos would reveal to Tyrande that Sylvanas is going beyond the Veil, before she promptly beheads Nathanos. Sylvanas would make her way to Icecrown to battle against Bolvar, the current Lich King, with her greatly empowered Moor abilities. Maybe the story of BFA comes across better when told through a recap, but from my experiences with it in the game at the time, it was one of the toughest parts of the expansion to process. The ending with Nazoth leaving a particularly bad taste in my mouth. The pacing was bad, and it felt like the expansion was attempted to tell multiple stories, to the point where it felt the writers weren't entirely sure what they were trying to achieve anymore, and it just felt bloated and confusing at times. For me personally, I feel both Najata and Nihilotha were deserving of their own expansions, and to see them reduced to simply one zone and a raid just felt like such a missed opportunity. Another major issue with the plot is how the Horde were essentially cast as the villains of this story purely because of Sylvanas' actions. It was unfair and it upset a lot of players. I would just like to say that I'm not an expert on the lore by any means and this story recap was taken from a post on Reddit, which you can read here in the description if you're interested. I'm sure some people share my thoughts and feelings with the levelling experience in BFA. It was just bad. I think it's the worst levelling experience an expansion has offered, ever. As you grew stronger in levels, your character grew weaker in power. The promises of Azerite gear simply didn't deliver, and the loss of the artifact weapon and all the quality of life that came with it was so profound. As you continue to level, you would get to a stage where you would have to unequip your legendaries from Legion too, making your character even weaker. The Azerite gear could never match up to its predecessor, which felt very disappointing. As far as the zones went, I was impressed for the most part. I have to shout out Drustvar, as that zone was fantastic. I have nothing against the quests or the zones in BFA, it was mainly the regression of our characters. I was the High Lord in Legion, and I really felt that, 
in BFE, I was supposedly the champion of Azeroth, but I didn't feel like this at all. And no matter how many times Magni called me champion, it didn't help. BFA introduced something called the War Campaign, which is a side story that will follow throughout your adventures in Kul Tiras and Zandalar, and it works in a similar fashion to the Order Hall quest from Legion. The War Campaign was necessary as it gated several systems in Battle for Azeroth. I'll use examples from the Alliance side as that is the faction I'm most familiar with. The Mission Table, and 5 followers by the time you're done with the campaign. The Continent of Zandalar. Access to War Effort Advancements, which were the equivalent of Order Hall resources. Access to the Seventh Legion Reputation, which you would need to hit Revered with as it was a requirement for the Azerothian Diplomat achievement, which was required for Battle for Azeroth's Pathfinder, which as covered in the Legion video, would grant access to flying in the new continents. And finally World Quests, in both Kul Tiras and Zandalar, as well as the Flightmaster's Whistle. At the end of the 8.0 War Campaign, you will receive the achievement Ready for War, this achievement was a requirement for both Pathfinder and part of the criteria to unlock the Dark Iron Dwarf allied race. At the end of the 8.1 War Campaign, you will receive the achievement Tides of Vengeance. Tides of Vengeance is part of the criteria to unlock the Kul'tier and allied race. People complained about being gated by things in Legion, but felt even more frustrated with this. Regardless of my personal issues with the leveling experience, until the War Within launches, BFA is still the starting experience of brand new players which I think is an okay introduction for them in regards to how modern WoW is, although they won't have a clue what's going on with the story. But I discussed this in length in another one of my videos, which you can check out here if you're interested. Azerite power was the successor to Legion's artifact power going into BFA, tied to the necklace I mentioned in the story recap, the Heart of Azeroth. The Heart of Azeroth absorbs Azerite, which would increase its levels, granting you new abilities. Tied to the Heart of Azeroth was the new Azerite gear that would be featuring in BFA, with the helm, shoulders and chest slots unlocking special bonuses. This was extremely over exaggerated by Blizzard when showcased at Blizzcon, and the traits were nothing like they were described to be. The majority of them being passives, pure stat stick increases and procs. Tons and tons of procs. Similarly to what I had mentioned in the Legion video, whilst Blizzard may attempt to offer choice, whether that be talents, covenants or anything else, it will always boil down to the meta and that is just one problem Blizzard won't ever be able to solve. The issue with Azerite traits was, nothing felt particularly good, and it was a far cry from what the players received in Legion. Azerite gear may have appeared novel and cool in theory, but it quickly became frustrating. Having to pay to respec the gear was simply odd considering Blizzard removed paying for respecs expansions ago. The gear was also confusing, as you weren't sure if a piece of gear at say, 430 item level could be as good compared to a 445 one that had worse traits. There was a real lack of clarity with Azerite gear and the way it could impact your gameplay experience. I enjoy grinding, to some extent, and I really enjoyed maxing out my artifact weapon back in Legion, but I can wholeheartedly say I did not enjoy leveling the heart of Azeroth one bit. The success of Legion influenced Blizzard to continue with borrowed power, but it felt too samey, more demanding, and ultimately the rewards and perks we got were not on the levels of its predecessor in Legion. The somewhat saving grace with Azerite and the heart of Azeroth was Essences. Essences really needed to be in the game on launch. Essences were added in patch 8.2 and could be gained after completing a questline and establishing a hub in Najatar. The Heart Forge would let players infuse their Heart of Azeroth with Essences, granting new combat related powers, with certain Essences being accessible depending on what spec your character is playing. Much like Talents, once you've learned an Essence, you can apply or swap it out to a new Heart of Azeroth interface when you're in rest areas, cities, or when using items such as Tome of the Quiet Mind. Similarly to Glyphs, Essences had both major and minor abilities. Upon completing the initial quest, you'll open a single major slot in the Heart of Azeroth, and as you continue to level your necklace, you'll unlock additional slots. The majors would generally serve as active abilities and the minor passive abilities. The Essences each had four ranks that would provide new effects. Rank 1 would provide a unique ability based on your role of DPS, healer or tank, and Rank 2 and 3 would provide enhancements to both the Essences major and minor effects. Rank 4 adds a flashier cosmetic effect to the spells and provides a unique visual designed to make you stand out from the crowd. Whilst I sing the praise of Essences, they were not perfect. The bad thing with Essences was how awful it felt that all of your progress and time spent unlocking them was only tied to one character, and in situations like this where I can't understand how Blizzard haven't had the foresight to see the problem staring them in the face. Another issue with Essences was forcing people to engage in content they perhaps weren't interested in, or maybe even hated. One of my friend's Biss Essences was Blood of the Enemy, 
and this was gated behind a PvP quest. My friend had no experience in PvP, he had no interest in it whatsoever. He was forced into it to achieve his base essence, and that just feels bad. Like most Blizzard things, I really felt the potential with Azerite armor, and I bought into what they were selling. It felt like a big risk replacing tier sets for it, and sadly it didn't pay off. The term if it ain't broke don't fix it comes to mind. World quests were introduced in Legion, and at the time of Legion, I enjoyed them. It was new, it was unfamiliar, and they didn't seem particularly demanding, and they kept you engaged with all of the zones on a regular basis. World quests in Battle for Azeroth, and the tasks that came with them, felt like a different beast entirely. The term falling behind is mentioned a lot in World of Warcraft. Oh, I need to do this or I'll fall behind. I need to make sure I do this before I log off or I'll fall behind. This felt extreme in BFA. It felt like a treadmill, and the amount of tasks required of you would increase as the patches went on until eventually, well, it looked like this. Don't get me wrong, I like having things to do, it's why I talk to Legion so well. Going from sitting in your garrison all day in Warlords of Draenor to chasing artifact power in Legion and playing Endless Mythic Plus was a great switch in tone for me, but I understand that everybody liked it. BFA felt like it kicked that into overdrive. It was demanding and tiresome. To me it was beginning to feel more like a job, and I finally felt myself burning out and felt that I needed to take some time away from the game. Whilst I said I was going to leave PvP out as I'm not very experienced with it, it's important to mention War Mode as it was a huge feature of BFA to fit with the theme of the Faction War. I can't speak for the class balance or overall PvP design, so I'd love to hear in the comments how you felt about PvP during BFA, but what I can talk about is War Mode's introduction and its incentives. Traditionally World of Warcraft had a variety of different realms, such as PvE, PvP, RP, RP PvP. Blizzard stated regarding War Mode, with War Mode, we wanted to solve the problem of some players feeling locked into one playstyle or another by their realm choice. They might have picked a PvE realm purely because their friends were there, even though they were interested in open world PvP. Conversely, they could have chosen a PvP realm to start, but later decided it wasn't for them anymore. So War Mode allowed players on any realm to participate in open world PvP with just the click of a button. Activating War Mode applies the enlisted buff and would provide incentives to compensate for the perceived risk of being targetable by the opposing faction, such as a 10% experience increase from killing monsters and completing quests, and increasing rewards from world quests like Azerite power and gold by 10%. If a faction is outnumbered, a war mode call to arms adds up to a further 20% bonus. If the participation is overwhelmingly one-sided, then the opposing faction will be offered the quest against overwhelming odds, as an even further incentive to participate. Additionally, activating War Mode enables PvP talents in the open world. War Mode can only be activated while in Stormwind, Ogrima, or Valdraken as of Dragonflight. It can be deactivated at any rest zone. There were airdrops that also featured in the continents of Cortiras and Zandalar, which would drop a war supply crate where players can fight over and claim for their faction. Once a faction has gained control of the crate, anyone of that faction who is within the area will have a short period of time to open it and collect a piece of personal loot. The Bounty Hunter system was also introduced. Killing a certain amount of players of the opposing faction without dying would award the status of Assassin that increases the player's damage and healing by 15%. The downside to this, the more players the Assassin kills, the more likely they'll show up on the zone map for other players to target and to gain a bounty. Players who successfully kill an Assassin of the opposing faction will receive conquest points as well as other rewards. I feel I have to mention the Battle of Najatar too, and whilst I love the idea of this, it felt like the Battle of Najatar just chewed up the servers and spat them out. When you pressed Moonfire, the game rolled all these dice to figure out what's happening with your character. Now, every time the game has ticked, or the damage spell has ticked, the game has had to recheck all of those values every single time. You get where we're coming from. So what we've gone is from a simple point of two die, being in classic to a whole pile of them here right now this is because I pressed one spell however I'm not going to just fire moonfire and let it sit there in fact I'm gonna fire spells in between which do all kinds of other crazy things this is three seconds worth of gameplay pretty much as all these calculations are going on but then we're in a raid group which means this is magnified by 10, 20, 30 people who are all casting spells as well, let alone the enemy if we're in PvP. Now 
Now we've got lag. The dungeons in BFA are decent, I feel, but I must condemn Temple of Sethralis, because I absolutely hated that place personally. That hellhole aside, BFA had some good dungeons, in the likes of Atoldazar, Freehold, King's Rest, and Siege of Baralus. I thought Waycrest Manor was fun too, and it reminded me of Hawk Manor a little from Final Fantasy XIV. I loved how that dungeon offered different routes and pathing, which wasn't ideal for Mythic Plus if certain ways were closed, but it was still a fun idea. There might be the odd clangor in dungeons, for example, I wasn't a massive fan of the Motherload, but you might love it. Overall, I would say that I think BFA did a pretty solid job of its dungeons. King's Rest would be my personal favourite. BFA also expanded the Mega Dungeon series with Operation Mechagon, which I thought was really great. Karazhan was a lot of fun in Legion, and I was glad to see this was a trend they wanted to expand on. I have fond memories of the hard mode option this dungeon had. To activate the hard mode, you had to defeat the first three bosses while the HK8 Aerial Oppression unit is hovering above them. This would make the encounters a bit more challenging, as it would summon robots into each encounter, so you have to dodge those as well as resolving mechanics from the boss. After this, other bosses could become empowered upon activation, such as Kujo with the stacking Noxious Stench debuff. The real challenge was the big cheese himself, King Mechagon. If all of the steps were done correctly, you would enter King Mechagon's room to find a red button. You hit the button and it would activate the hard mode when you pull the boss. The major change that always sticks in my mind in this encounter, mainly because I was a part of so many failed groups with it, was the input panel mechanic. People found this so challenging that groups would actually advertise for voice communication, just to make sure it was executed correctly, and I really liked that. Anything that forces people to work as a team, count me in. So the hard mode encounter involves an untargetable NPC that is primed to detonate once its countdown finishes. It has an energy bar which drains at a rate of 20 energy every 9 seconds. If that energy bar hits zero, you're done for, and it's a wipe. However, once this mob gets to 35 energy, a termination sequence will begin, and this is where the input panel mechanic begins. You'll notice these four glowing panels near the entrance when you came in. The colour and picture isn't relevant, and the only thing your group needs to remember is the activation order of the input panels. Players must then input the correct termination sequence by clicking in the order you saw earlier. Inputting the correct termination sequence will reset the energy back to 100. It's important to note there isn't enough time for players to move between input panels, so you need a party member stationed at each panel, and this is what made teamwork and communication vital. Termination sequence will occur every 45 seconds throughout the entire of King Mechagon's encounter, which can cause some pretty nasty overlaps with some of his mechanics. When I did this, we had our tank call the input panels based on markers. The rewards for completing hard mode Operation Mechagon was a mount and a 430 Azerite helm that would randomly be rewarded to a player, and if you complete the entire run without a single death, you will obtain the Hertz Lock of Feet of Strength, which grants you the rank 4 Azerite Essence Vision of Perfection. I think something that has really spoiled dungeons of expansions, at least up until the end of Shadowlands, was that you were essentially banging your head against the same dungeons for about two years, and that gets pretty tiresome after a while. Freehold might be your favourite dungeon, but running it for two years? That doesn't sound like a great time. Thankfully, we're now at a stage in WoW where we're seeing dungeons long forgotten make a return in Mythic Plus seasons, like the Everbloom from Warlords of Draenor, or Temple of the Jade Serpent from Mists of Pandaria, and that is so refreshing, and it gives players something to look forward to when the new season rolls around. I think overall, Mythic Plus has exposed dungeons a little, still to this day, as when you turn it into a competition against the clock, the design really shows, and I know this is something they're trying to address. Mythic Plus was a novelty when it was introduced in Legion, and at this point, it just feels more about it being a competition and chasing Raider IO score, which is fine if that's what you want to do, but I think they should attempt to do something more meaningful with it. It just feels like an obligation to get your weekly vault, and I feel it's capable of so much more. Some people have expressed a displeasure with dungeons being so linear, which obviously stems from them now being accommodated into Mythic Plus. We don't really see dungeons such as Blackrock Depths anymore, for example, because they don't fit the mould of what World of Warcraft is now, and that's simply down to the game's evolution, and not much can really be done about that. Perhaps the expansion feature of Delves in The War Within can open the door again for some good old-fashioned exploration. Mythic Plus was also returning from Legion, and received some updates with BFA with the introduction of Seasonal Affixes. The Seasonal Affixes would be introduced on keys 10 plus and higher. Unlike the original Affixes, which would rotate weekly, these would span the entire of the Mythic Plus season, and usually share a theme with the current raid tier. These affixes often require greater changes in strategy and pathing through the dungeon, either to reach all objectives or to deliberately omit one. 
The most BFA I played was in the final season, so I have fond memories of Season 4's Nyarlotha themed affix, Awakened. Dungeons in Season 4 had obelisks throughout and allowed players to enter Nyarlotha and confront powerful servants of Nazoth. If a servant is not dealt with, they must be faced during the final boss encounter. A common tactic would be to enter the vision, kite the ad and kill it somewhere to then exit the portal, having skipped a ton of mobs in the actual dungeon. Think of it as a rogue shroud of concealment. It was a great way to bypass troublesome trash packs. Seasonal affixes have since been retired as of Season 2 of Dragonflight, which I think is a shame personally. I feel the seasonal affixes really kept the seasons fresh and exciting. I think the raids in BFA are solid, and whilst I only experienced them on Heroic, besides the odd mythic fight here and there until Nyalotha, I have fun memories of all the raids, which I participated in as a healer, besides Crucible of Storms, as I wasn't playing at that time. Aldia interested me from a lore perspective, and I felt most fights in here were enjoyable. I enjoyed the elevator boss in Talok, and maybe this is large praise, but I think Mother is one of my favourite fights in World of Warcraft. I loved it. I enjoyed Fetid Devourer too and loved the chaotic damage that came with it. Gahoon is also a very well received encounter, and I thought the reorigination drive was an interesting mechanic, and the roof collapsing in the final phase added a lot of pressure. The Battle of Dazar Alloy is fascinating, unique, and I think it's a very special raid due to the fact there are Alliance and Horde storyline wings. For this to make sense, depending on what faction you were, you would be able to experience these wings by talking to a scout inside the instance after reaching the beginning of said wing. This would allow you to temporarily change race and racials, matching the opposing faction. I didn't have a great deal of experience with this raid, and I think I took a break from BFA after clearing it once or twice, but the theme of this raid just screamed Warcraft to me. I didn't enjoy all the fights in here, but I've always enjoyed fights like Opulence. It strangely reminded me of the spoils of Pandaria in Siege of Ogrima. I love splitting up into groups and working as a team. I think Rastakhan was a fun fight too, and I loved the use of Wansamdi. Again, working together and splitting up with the Death Realm is just the kind of gameplay that I really love participating in. Rastakhan was worthy of a good encounter, and to have four phases was very fitting for someone of his stature. I always wondered when we were going to see him in the MMO. It was just a shame we had to say goodbye to him so soon. Mechatork might be the best boss in here, at least for me. It was a three phase encounter that required strong knowledge and communication. Communication was very important in this fight, as players would need to talk to one another and share key information needed to shut down the High Tinker Sparkbot companions. This fight was absolute chaos, especially if you pugged it, which I'm sure many of you did for the G mod mount. I'm not sure if this is a slept on fight, but I wanted to shout out the Stormwall blockade too. Again, I just think I have a real thing about splitting up the teams and working together, and then in phase 2 everybody regroups and fights against the boss directly. I enjoyed the organisation and the amount of mechanics that needed to be resolved. The prospect of Jaina being the final encounter of this raid had me… interested. Regardless of her instability in the past, it never crossed my mind that Blizzard would actually kill her off, especially in BFA when they were pushing her as one of the main characters. I only did this fight once when it was current, so I don't have much memory of it, but I did go back and get the mount. What always sticks out in my mind with the Jaina encounter is how players would cheese the intermission on Mythic. You'd create four groups of five, and as soon as Jaina is pushed out of phase one, group one would stand towards the edge of the boat to get frozen. The rest of the raid would be outside the range. They break them out, and then the next group moves forward and gets frozen. This allows you to skip the whole intermission, and when done correctly, you have two groups at zero stacks, one group around 6 or 7, and the last at about 12. I did this when taking part in the mount farming, and it honestly wasn't necessary, and certainly isn't fun. It felt wrong, and it made the encounter with Jaina feel lessened. I took a break after Dazara Law, citing Burnout, but I came back when the Eternal Palace dropped. When I knew Queen Ajara was finally coming in, I wasn't going to miss that. I owed it to myself as a lifelong fan of the franchise to square off against her. The bosses I enjoyed the most in this raid and you can call me a weirdo for it, but the Blackwater Behemoth was a fun idea to me. Having to maintain the bioluminescence buff and avoid swimming in the open water, I don't know, it was fun to me. I like it when Blizzard get creative and try new things. Ashvane was a fun encounter to heal, and it felt good to put an end to her story after everything she'd been causing in the narrative. Whilst I play healer, I think it's fun seeing your raid team pump as much damage into a boss as possible in a certain window, and I enjoyed the potentially high damage based on soaking the bubbles. It was a simple encounter, but memorable. Queen Ajara was the most fun in here, I think. But I have to stress how spoiled I think this boss was due to the use of add-ons. This fight had three ancient wards in the encounter area, and they would be depleted via Ajara's abilities. 
If a ward reaches zero, it will trigger a pressure surge that deals high ticking damage to the raid. If all three reach zero energy, that's a wipe. There was a lot of chaos in this fight and so much to go over, but the most memorable of it all was the Queen's Decree. And this is where the add-ons really came into play to try and help players determine their actions. There are four decrees. The first one is Suffer. Soak an arcane orb. These orbs will deplete while players are stood inside them, so it's possible you may have needed to find another if your orb was soaked very quickly. The second is Obey. Do not stand in an arcane orb. The third decree is Stand Together. This is exactly what it says on the tin. Stand near another player. You can look to help soak an arcane orb with this decree as it helps remove them before they would explode at the end of the transmission. And finally, Stand Alone. Again, self-explanatory. It doesn't sound too hectic right now, but in Heroic, players are given up to two decrees this time, and you'll have to quickly identify which combination of decrees you've been given to minimise the amount of sanction stacks you would receive. Additionally, two new decrees are added to both intermissions in Stay and March. Players with the Stay decree will have a purple zone placed around them, and if they leave that zone they'll gain stacks of sanction. Players with March need to keep moving, as patches will spawn underneath their feet and detonate, again applying stacks of sanction. I didn't do Queen Ajara on Mythic, but in Mythic, players would have to deal with three decrees. I think this boss was really great, even on Heroic. It really suited Queen Ajara's character and it had just the right amount of chaos needed. Use of add-ons here wasn't that groundbreaking, not like it is today, but I still feel players shouting above their heads their given decree spoiled it a little bit. That being said, we haven't seen the last of Queen Ajara and it'll be very interesting to see what happens when she inevitably returns. I also felt I needed to mention how amusing it was performing certain emotes on Ajara. Here is a list of some of the things that happened. Nihilotha was the big one for me, because it's when I was playing BFA the most and progressing Mythic. We weren't exactly allowed to leave the house at this point, so regardless of BFA's faults, it was a great crutch during those tough times, something WoW has always been good at. I always thought Nihilotha would have been expansion worthy rather than just a raid, and regardless of how well Blizzard tried to sell the faction war, I think we all knew this expansion was going to end with Nazov. Whilst I spent most of my time in here, I'm not sure how hot I am on the bosses when I look back. The Rathian fight on Mythic was very fun. I loved the responsibility some players had when destroying the spikes. I enjoyed bosses like Vexiona and Shadhar, but the best fight in here by a million miles, and my favourite fight in World of Warcraft ever, is Dark Inquisitor Zanesh. I don't think a fight in WoW has ever made me feel the way that boss did. I had so much fun with it. Similarly to the Ajara fight, who also features in this encounter too, there's a lot to talk about. There's often one mechanic that defines a fight, for better or worse, and that mechanic is the Void Orb, also known as football. He done it! A Void Orb will spawn from a portal and will begin to drift towards the middle of the room where Queen Ajara is. If the Void Orb touches Ajara's Void Barrier or the edge of the encounter space, it will explode with a Dark Collapse and despawn. Dark Collapse does huge damage to the raid and grants the boss two buffs, Dark Ascension, increasing the damage done by the next Dark Collapse by 500%, and also Fanaticism, which will increase the boss's attack speed by 50% for 30 seconds. So we need to get rid of the orb, and the only way to do that is to make the Void Orb enter the portal with the red outline around it. Upon reaching that portal, the orb will despawn. So now it's time to assemble your raid team to become Pep Guardiola's Barcelona team of 2010 and play some tiki taka football. Players with the Void Woken buff can redirect the orb by moving it or letting it move into them. If a player without the buff touches the orb, they will take a revile hit, taking damage and being knocked back. When the orb touches a Void Woken player, it will immediately redirect and start drifting in the direction the player was facing, and this part is crucial. Heroic makes this a little trickier as there are now obelisks in the area to make it more difficult to pass the ball around. So now whilst you have the powers and teamwork of Barcelona, you now need the vision of Mesut Ozil or Kevin De Bruyne to ensure victory. The mythic change on this encounter makes it more difficult to navigate the Void Orb to its destination due to an increase in the number of obelisks. The second change to this on mythic is that whenever a player touches the Void Orb, an awakened terror will spawn. I can't speak highly of this fight enough and would never talk about a boss in such length if I didn't think it was worthy. I love the teamwork and the inevitable chaos that came with this fight and it's one of my favourite memories of BFA. I don't know how I feel about Nazoth, still to this day. Narratively, I've accepted it. It was poor. But as an encounter, I didn't hate it. The legendary cloak of the sanity gauge was interesting, unless you were doing Raid Finder and a bunch of people didn't have it, then it wasn't so interesting. I thought the fight was quite messy 
but I do enjoy fights that have realms and require teamwork, and this just seemed to be a theme of BFA. I like the use of Deathwing and Ajara, and I really enjoyed the all or nothing approach as you would attempt to burn down Azoth as fast as you could, while losing players to insanity towards the end of the fight. I'm probably a bit torn with Nazoth because of the way I feel about the story. I think both Carapace and Nazoth are fine encounters, I was just disappointed with the story side of things, but overall, I had a great time with Nihilofa. Island Expeditions are one of the three box features that would be accessible with Battle for Azeroth. They have three player scenarios with the simple goal of obtaining Azerite on an Uncharted Island. It had three difficulties in Normal, Heroic and Mythic, and it was also a PvP difficulty. The method of obtaining Azerite is left to the players to decide. You can kill enemies, loot chests, mine Azerite, and there are also special events that take place. Island Expeditions felt mandatory to maintain your Heart of Azeroth level. I can appreciate the idea of Island Expeditions, but it was essentially a glorified power farmer, with the loot far too RNG to be considered fun. Rewards were dependent on your performance during the expedition, and some could be mounts, pets and transmog depending on what creatures existed on the island. You would also earn seafarers doubloons which could be exchanged with traders for island rewards. When I think about Island Expeditions, the first thing that comes to mind for me is how people used it to level characters. A hotfix was made to substantially increase the experience rewards for characters between level 110 to 119, after completing normal Island Expeditions. This provided a good way to level up a character, as well as collecting a good amount of Azerite power along the way. I feel that Blizzard tried their best to make it work with updates as the patches went on, whether that be the introduction of Azerite essences to chase after, or new maps and rewards, it wasn't the worst thing in BFA. The lack of payoff and service they provided wasn't very fun, and you felt forced to engage with it, rather than having a desire to want to do it. Ultimately, Island Expeditions are seen as a bit of a blunder in BFA. The second box feature would be Warfronts. Warfronts were a 20 man PvE cooperation mode, meant to represent the large scale war on the home front, as members of each faction fight for control of a location critical to their war efforts. Inspired by the real time strategy origins of Warcraft 3, Warfronts allow you to play the role of a lieutenant, leading the charge for a massive battle. The group is responsible for creating outposts, securing resources, and training troops to push the assault forward and conquering the enemy's stronghold. However, unlike Warcraft 3, you won't be commanding the action from a top-down perspective. You would be engaging in battle with your player character. The biggest criticism of Warfronts is just how easy they were. It was also a difficult system for Blizzard to approach. If they make it challenging to the point where people either fail or can't participate, then it's simply going to breed resentment. Warfronts were actually very similar to looking for raid looking back, as there was no real communication, which meant no strategy, and Warfronts were designed to be a homage to Warcraft 3, which was all about strategy. So this was already failing. I can still remember the video where Asmogul decided to try and lose a Warfront, because you could stomp them with such minimal effort. He AFK'd for about 30 minutes until Turalyon was eventually defeated. This showcased just how pathetic Warfronts were. The solution for Warfronts, in my opinion, was... It just simply had to be a battleground. 20 vs 20 PvP would have been the answer. There was a lot of untapped potential with Warfronts, and the idea felt a lot better than the actual execution. I really loved the idea of allied races, and I think this was something players wanted for a long time. Further customization. There are so many different types of sub-races, let's call them. Think of the amount of dwarf or control clans, for example. I think this is something that Blizzard could continue to work on. The added customization options in Shadowlands were a big win, but I still feel that there needs to be more. The variety of new races added in BFA was cool. The biggest criticism of the allied races was the amount of effort you had to put in to unlock them. As a box feature, it should have been baseline immediately in my opinion. They should have featured a little unlocked quest to explain why they were joining the fight, and that should have been it. The allied races remained repgated until patch 9.1 of Shadowlands, and it took Blizzard until July 2023 with patch 10.1.5 of Dragonflight to remove all remaining restrictions, except the level requirement. The fact this took so long was just simply ridiculous from Blizzard. I think further customization is hopefully going to continue with WoW, as we recently saw an Eridar customization for the Drenai introduced in Dragonflight. Say what you will about BFA, but these zones and this patch single-handedly saved the expansion for me. My engagement with BFA was pretty dire until this patch dropped, and these zones really revitalised my interest in the game, and had me enjoying the goals I was now working towards again, which was mainly collecting. I've always been a collector, and I love a good achievement hunt, so Mechagon was just perfect for me, and it felt like there was a great sense of community in this zone, people helping each other with achievements and chasing rare mobs together. 
I can understand that zones like this and the Tyrus Isle, for example, aren't for everybody, but Mechagon ticked all the right boxes. This kind of gameplay is perfect for me. Najatar felt more of the same. I was initially upset that Najatar was just simply one zone, but I didn't let that spoil it for me. I loved the progression with the followers that you could level up, I loved hunting the rare mobs, completing the achievements, and just exploring a zone that we've heard so much about. You had the Battle of Najatar, even some of the world quests in the place were fun. It felt like there was something here for everyone. I also had to get the crab mount, obviously. The main gripe with both of these zones was that you had to participate in them to achieve the Pathfinder achievement, which would allow you to fly in the BFA zones. I talk about Pathfinder in more detail in my Legion video. Loot generally felt exhausting in BFA, whether that be RNG, the Mythic Plus Cash, or Titan Forging. Whilst these things all existed inside Legion, I don't recall it feeling quite as bad as it did in BFA. Feel free to call me out on that if you disagree. More than half of the Azerite armor drops in the game for a majority of slots and classes were downgrades, even at a 20 item level increase. And whilst I know some people who really liked it, I think personal loot was hugely damaging to the game, in tandem with the limits on trading. It didn't feel good at all. Blizzard's ignorance and refusal to bring back Master Looter, despite how many times people would plea with them, was just frustrating. It hurt organized raiding, and it caused masses of loot to go to waste. A new currency in Titan Residuum was introduced in the Tides of Vengeance patch. This was designed to help players obtain Azerite armor. The currency could be obtained from a handful of sources, and players could spend this currency at Thaumaturge Vashreen to receive a piece of Azerite gear. As mentioned before, Azerite gear felt so janky that gambling with the Residuum didn't feel good, and you could potentially get the same piece multiple times in a row. And similarly, that is what made the Mythic Plus Cash feel so bad, an issue that existed in Legion 2 but wasn't resolved until Shadowlands. I covered Titan Forging in my Legion video, so I won't be delving into Titan Forging in this video, but it would be disingenuous to not talk about the Benthic gear from Najatar, as the system upset a lot of players. Benthic gear was a system introduced in Patch 8.2, similar to Legion's Relinquished gear and Mr. Pandaria's Timeless gear. The system allowed players to obtain Bind on Account gear which can be obtained via world quests, random drops from rare creatures in Najatar, table missions, and so on. There's also an NPC to upgrade the gear with a currency known as Prismatic Mana Pearls. This would increase the gear's stats, and sometimes the magnitude of their equip effect. It became what felt like a constant lottery of attempting to get both gem sockets, as well as tertiary stats on the gear. This frustrated players to no end, as the gear was essentially better than Mythic gear if you were lucky enough to roll the right stats and get the bonuses. Titan Forging was exhausting in Legion, and I expect just hearing Benthic gear evokes a lot of anger and frustration for some players. Rewards wise, you know, I think we're looking to something like Mana Pearls from Najdatar as an inspiration, uh, minus some of the, you know, RNG Benthic gear that ended up being best in slot for the hey, raid. Thank you. I'm gonna say it. I loved Corruption. Maybe it's a controversial take, but I genuinely had a great time with it, and it just felt like the shackles were being removed and we were finally allowed to have some fun with the game. Corruption was brought in near the end of BFA as a replacement for Titan Forging. I found Corruption interesting as it added both a positive effect and stacking negative attributes which incurred penalties at various thresholds. While the negative effects could reach a point where they became debilitating, carefully managing the bonuses and penalties allowed for a great deal of customization and a huge power gain. It was also possible to cleanse the corrupted gear by visiting Mother in the Chamber of Heart. As a Holy Paladin, I had so much fun with Ineffable Truth. I knew this was something that wasn't sustainable, and I really did hope it wouldn't go beyond BFA, and I think that contributed to my enjoyment of it. It felt like we were going out of BFA with a bang, and for me, that was fun. I don't doubt corruption broke certain elements of the game, and whilst I'm not a PvPer, I can only imagine how things went down in this patch. I can only share my experiences I had with it, and I had fun. A major complaint about corruption was the vendor had a rotation of what corruptions would be available that week which was frustrating as sometimes you would have to wait multiple weeks to finally be able to get what you wanted. It felt similar to Legion Legendaries, it would have made a lot more sense to just have them available from the jump so players could just pick and choose what they wanted. I think Horrific Visions is my favourite feature of BFA. It might even be better than the Mage Tower in Legion. Horrific Visions are small group challenges introduced in patch 8.3, with rewards such as a transmogable backpack, a corrupted mementos currency, which would be essential for titanic research which would grant you perks inside the visions, and also several Azerite essences. It also included the legendary cloak which was a requirement for the Nazoth encounter in the Nihilotha raid. 
The visions are scenarios where players would explore corrupted visions of Stormwind and Ogrimmar and complete objectives to disrupt this vision, preventing it from becoming a reality. Players would explore the same horrific visions throughout the week, either Ogrimmar or Stormwind, that would rotate on a weekly basis. To take part in horrific visions, each member of the party must have a vessel of horrific visions in their inventory. This would be consumed when the vision begins. The vessels are obtained from completing the Black Empire assaults in either the Veil of Eternal Blossoms or Oldham, which also had a weekly rotation. Additionally, you could obtain these vessels via Rathian at the cost of 10,000 coalescing visions, which was a currency used in patch 8.3. The goal in Horrific Visions is to complete certain objectives. There are a total of 5 objectives per vision, and there is a main objective and 4 bonus objectives. It's important to mention that you have a sanity gauge too, which is essentially your time limit, so it wouldn't be possible to complete all objectives until you've purchased some upgrades that provide resistance against sanity draining effects, or provide opportunities to restore sanity. Similarly to Mythic Plus, affixes existed inside this mode, named Madness. Each area of the vision will have a madness that is applied to the player. These are secondary effects the player will experience while active in the areas. These madness affixes will be consistent for subsequent visits within the week, but will change weekly. Each type of area has its own pool of madness effects. These can be viewed ahead of time by opening up the map and mousing over the objectives. Possible madness affixes in twisted areas would be desynchronized, bloodthirsty, and promised power. The possible madness affixes in corrupted areas would be entomophobia, dark delusions, and scorched feet. And finally, possible madness affixes in lost areas would be split personality, leaden foot, and haunting shadows. There was also the Faceless Mask endgame system for Horrific Visions, and this was so fun. This would allow you to make your visions more challenging, but also more rewarding. Throughout your explorations, you will eventually obtain these masks and be able to activate them prior to your run beginning, if you so choose. All five Faceless Masks share the same effect, and if multiple masks are active, their effects are added. For example, 25% more health to all enemies, 25% damage of all enemies, and plus 20 corrupted mementos gained. In addition to the above, each mask has a unique effect. The Faceless Mask of the Long Night will reduce your sanity by 50%. The Faceless Mask of the Burned Bridge would mean moving causes void zones to spawn in your path, and drain sanity if standing within them. The Faceless Mask of the Daredevil would mean all sanity damage caused by creatures is increased by 400%. The Faceless Mask of the Pained would mean each area will consist of two madnesses, instead of one. And finally, the Faceless Mask of Dark Imagination. While below 50% sanity, occasionally an enemy of the Void will spawn and attack you. I really enjoyed playing 5 mask runs with one of my friends, and I have good memories of this game mode. I love a challenge, and I love to push myself, and it was clear that a lot of thought and love went into making this, and I think it really delivered. I'm sure the mode wasn't for everybody, and there are likely people who resent it because, similarly to Mechagon, Nashatar, and Island Expeditions, the gameplay was imposed upon you. And that's one of the biggest issues with BFA, sadly. You didn't get to choose what you wanted to take part in, the game just told you what to do. That being said, Horrific Visions for me was the perfect send off for what felt like a really challenging time in World of Warcraft. This war started with Sylvanas, so I feel it's only fitting we end this video with her, as the road to BFA ends and Shadowlands begins. Sylvanas' fall from grace is honestly quite depressing, as she was such a beloved and treasured character in the franchise and has now become one of the most hated. Sylvanas is what you would refer to as an OG in the Warcraft universe. She was on the pedestal with the likes of Arthas and Illidan, and to see what she's been reduced to is nothing short of tragic. And that's what she was, a tragic character, from her death to the loss of her homeland and attempting to build a new one. I think her becoming War Chief in Legion was unexpected, but I feel that it was received well. I think if you told people the story of Sylvanas in both BFA and Shadowlands ahead of time, nobody would have believed you. That's how radical it was. I don't think players were upset that she went nuts exactly, because that seemed like a given. The tipping point was that Blizzard made the Horde complicit in her actions, and she'd grown powerful beyond measure, with no explanation at the time. I didn't hate Sylvanas, but I became apathetic to her. I'd lost interest in her. I was numb to everything she did, from her meaningless vague words to any actions she made. I feel if I'm ever to make a Shadowlands video, I'd really like to break down how I truly feel about her from start to finish, as there's so much more to say about her arc, but this isn't the place for it. Despite the road Sylvanas continues to walk after BFA, she isn't the worst part about it, but she is a bitter taste in the mouths of many. It's all subjective of course, and you may still love Sylvanas, but a lot of players feel she's been utterly destroyed. 
Is Sylvanas beyond redemption? That's for you to decide. Not that it's her fault, of course, but I feel for Patty Madison as she's such a brilliant voice actress. And I personally can't wait to see her come back with Sylvanas when the time is right. Palthalas is calling. So now that we're all said and done, I don't think I'm going to condemn BFA like some players would. It had big issues and it definitely didn't live up to its predecessor, but I've said some positive things about BFA too, so I don't think it's as bad as I remember. But in the grand scheme of things, there was a lot of issues and most were not addressed until it was too late. Whilst there was the odd shining light on this expansion, it is vilified for a reason. It felt as though players were sold a dream with Azerite gear, and the box features of Island Expeditions and Warfronts were underwhelming. With all the tasks and chores that were expected of players, BFA felt exhausting for some. As I previously mentioned, the narrative was bloated, confusing, and ultimately disappointing. I appreciate Blizzard's ideas, but it was the execution that sadly failed. BFA set in motion a dark period for both the players and Blizzard leading into Shadowlands. This video is my opinion, and you may have similar or completely different views to me, and that's great. These videos are made for discussion, entertainment, and opinion. But that is more than enough from me. I want to know what you think. How do you feel about BFA? Has this video changed your opinion on the expansion? Did you have bad experiences with BFA, or do you perhaps feel it is judged too harshly? Maybe it's your favourite expansion? Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. Thank you so much for watching this video, especially if you sat through the whole thing. If you enjoyed this video, please consider liking and subscribing, and I'll see you in the next one.